<laughs> Dream it, believe it. Right, well, I got the water ready, Spencer. And become it. What's going on, Spence? <laughs> Come on down. Listen, man. Uh, plum breathing pleasure. So everyone's going to be jumping on for this special edition um, live with the fight right with myself. Spencer, the knowledge pharaoh, and Baba Tundi Ajayi, the master genius, as we're tackling the, um, a subject that has, it's, it's really been paramount in the last two years, especially with um, Tyson Fury, um, but it's something that we don't really touch on. And the thing that we're touching on today is mental health, not only in sport, not only in boxing, but in society. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, you know, it, it's great that, you know, we have this platform to, you know, most people, they see us, they know that we love this sport tremendously. And um, we always, we are always talking positively. And, um, you know, we're showing people um, the fun side to the sport. But there is a side inside the sport and outside the sport that is very serious. And it is the mental health um, topic. You know, and I'm so happy that tonight, myself, you, Gary Blake, ha really have a few minutes, and it is a few minutes when you look at the whole spectrum of, of, of what's going on to discuss this topic. You know, there are fighters in boxing that have committed suicide based on mental health, Spencer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. and it, it is something... It is something that we are, yeah, we're taking, we're take, it's, I was taken aback. Um, you know, when we think about this mental health thing, the pressure that hmm. is on a boxer. Come on, talking it. It's, it's like no other. You know what I mean? Big up October Red. But I'm saying that the pressure that is put on top of professional fighters, especially like everybody thinks like they have aspiration, they think straight away I'm gonna be a world champion. Oh, come on. And they think they're gonna be a millionaire yeah. in the first year of, of, yeah. of being yeah. in the sport. Yeah, you know, and it's very a short amount or a small amount of professional fighters that earn enough money. Come on. To give up their day job. There you go. Right? The signature, thank you very much for your three ninety nine pounds uh, that you put to us, the signature there. Um, and we love your support. And we love that the fact that you listen to us. We love the fact that you signature give us energy. Um, but you have to think about how strenuously stressful this sport is. And you know, too. And it's not only that, but it's like we... we there are loads of good people in boxing, right? Yes, sir. And, yes, sir. And sometimes we forget to prop the amount of good people that there are in boxing. The Stop amount right there. Before people. you even go on, Mick Collier. I'm going to say it again. I'm beating the drum for that, man. I'm going to say it again. Mickey Collier is the most kind-hearted, loving, caring person that I personally have come across in the in the sport of boxing in this country. Mickey Collier. Sorry, I had to cut you there, but big up the signature. Thank you. Thank you for the for the contribution. Right. And I, I'm saying, son, that Mick Collier is not only the most kindest guy inside of boxing, I would say that he's also one of the most thoughtful. <laughs> Come on. Right? And as far as I'm concerned, Mick Collier should be running the British Board of Control. One million percent. Right? But you know Mickey's got peas, so... <laughs> no, 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 no. Mickey's gone. He's been doing... He's been doing <laughs> so, so, you right. know... Have you seen him at Atlanta in his house, too? You tell it. Anyway, let's not talk about that. Let, let, let's... No, no. See, I have to pick up Mickey Collier. I can't know what you You have to... <laughs> You go two miles just to get to his house. To his yard. Bro, when I went to Mickey's house the first time, he was and tired. I broke through the gates, I was thinking from a little corner, 
I was like, no sir. This thing ain't stopping. But big up Mick Collier. Um, and you know what? As we touch on this, the free the, there are many boxes that are, are unbeknown to I know a few people. Uh let me just say there are many boxers who have actually committed suicide in the sport of boxing due to mental health. You yeah, know, so and I the thing serious. And 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 you know, one of the I mean I, there's there's two names that stick in my head. The first one, most notably, is the Olympic bronze medalist, the Irish legend, Darren Sutherland. Yeah. And I remember, I remember reading an article from Steve Bunce and saying that, you know, because he knocked out his first three guys cleanly. And I remember, I think it was the full fight, he sustained a cut, you know, and... I remember, I remember reading Steve Bunn said that, you know, it was hard on himself. It was hard on himself. But, you know, you had a young man that left his home in Ireland, came, and apparently what a lot of people didn't realise is that he, or didn't know, that he was suffering from depression before. See? So he came from Ireland. I remember he was living with Maloney, uh, and the family, Frank Maloney, but then he went into a, a one bed flat. So yeah. this man was wait, on his wait, own. Wait a minute, pick up my sister. Sixty dollars. She's just donated. Come on, show. come and, on. Right. Uh, what's that? Camera. Serene. Is it Serene? Yeah, Karma, Karma, Serene. Yeah, Karma Shereen, right. Karma Shereen, thank you so, so much. You've been supporting the show from we started. Um, so thank you for that $60. Um, and and trust me, it's nothing but love for you. you know? Nothing but love. Karma said, Karma said, great show, guys. This talk is very much needed. Split this between you and and and, and get uh, get a drink after lockdown. Come on, bro. We're going to bust that done as a drink too. Um, Bailey's, you know, the strawberry Bailey's. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to run out the alcohol, but anyway, <laughs> it's just a joke, Spence. Don't try and bust the, the serious thing on me. Remember back in the day, Tony Street, enough red wine, you know, no, white wine, white wine. it's like, oh, no, I want Chardonnay. I said, Chardonnay, you're crap. I think you're in your mouth. <laughs> come on, oh, tight, come on. again, Serene. Thank you for the contribution to the show, and uh. Thank you for your support. Um, as I was saying, you know, Darren was suffering from uh, depression and mental health before he came to London. And then, you know, he had the fight. He, he won the fight. I remember he stopped the guy, but he got, he, he got a cut and apparently he was very down on himself. And, you know, the, the young man, you know, uh, ended up hanging himself, you know, and um, this is through depression, you know. Um, it's a very, very serious and delicate topic you know the other name i remember a young man lewis pinto one yeah. fight yeah he only had one fight spence you know had an argument with his girlfriend next thing boom i remember mickey collier saying got him his license the week after or two at his pro debut next week after that argument with a girlfriend this is what was reported and then the young man took his life so and then, uh, and then finally, you got uh, uh, the great Alexis Arguello. Arguello. You know, yeah. Arguello committed yeah. suicide as well. Yeah. So, and, but, and so, Edwin Valero. And Ed, that's the name I was look, looking yeah. for, Edwin Valero. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, what this highlights is that there are so many situations that boxes are in which the public don't see. Because it's a lonely sport and, you know, I'm grateful that a little bit later, 20 minutes time or so, we'll have um, a great young man, retired boxer now, uh, John Murray, to touch on this issue and tell us about how he's dealt with, um, you know, life after boxing and, and, and more so in the climate that we're in now where everybody is enclosed and rules and regulations have been placed upon us, which is increasing the mental health aspect. Yep, 
it, it, um, it is. And it's, you got to keep your mind occupied. Come on, talk and expense. It's so important to keep your mind occupied. It's so important to have a, a routine because you're thinking, okay, then we're on lockdown. You can't go nowhere. You're indoors. Some people may have children. Then it's a different whole scenario with, with the children because they got to have a homeschooling. Some people are just locked in the house. It's just them and their missus. It's like, or, 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 or the missus and, and, and their fella. But at this time here, it's like, if you keep your mind occupied in um, a scenario of a routine, yes, right? Your mind's gonna then become healthy because if you look at this thing where we're talking about mental health, the mentality of many people when saying the health within the word health is health, right? Mm. So we have to perpetually keep on, and we have to try and live in this in of our mindsets of a perpetuity that we are constantly like gaining new information, getting in a in a routine of things, so we so we don't. You know what I mean? So we, so we, so we don't fall into that trap because you turn on the TV right now. You know what I mean, nine point five percent that you see on the TV is negative, mm. right? Because negativity sells. Come on, come on, Lady Shan. Lady Shan was talking about this today. Is we got Lady Shan. You know what I mean? Right. Um. I'm saying once you start getting into to 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 a a, a a practice of something where there is an accomplishment but also a self accomplishment, it takes away um, the essence of you wasting your day because you know that you're actively doing something. So I would say to somebody, especially at this time, to set goals. Right. My, my talk about I mean, the thing is this. Right. I'll tell you a little trick that I do. I like, I like watching a lot of old black and white movies, right? Mm. And without pressing the eye on the TV, what gives you all the information on the TV, I like to I like to turn around and say, this movie was made in such and such year. Come on. And then I say it's made in such and such year. And at the same time at that, I tried to name the heavyweight champion, the, the middleweight oh. champion, no, the light heavyweight champion, the middleweight champion, the worldweight champion, and I go down the list. I like doing that. Because that way it keeps my mind active. So yes. anything you gotta find. So you can find like little little things that's to to keep your mind active. Like reading is a great source. You know what I mean? Yes. I remember yes. talking from years back. Yeah, and I mean years. I mean years. We done we done some we done some. Remember, uh, Rich Free Two was there as well. Remember? Yes. You know yes. that workout. And yes. and when we was there, and there was a guy while we was there, and he said. Readers are leaders. There you go. Right? And and I know, like, I will copy certain things from certain people. There's certain times I'll phone Tundi and Tundi said, nah, man, I'm doing my study. And I thought, well, what, what kind of study you did? Like, he said, nah, I'm doing my study because he'd be reading. I remember, I remember, I remember you used to read scripture. I remember Tundi used to read scripture for about two hours a day. Yes, more so. Yeah, more I so. remember that. Right? Big up, K Smith. Thank you so much for the 999 uh, um, donation to our to our, to the channel. God bless you. God bless you, Kay. Thank you so much. Big up, Kay Smith, right. all day. Right. So, so you learn. You learn. You know what I mean? You know it goes like: show me your company, I'll show you who you are. Yes. Um. Show me your company, I'll tell you who you are. Yeah. And and more to oh D S M twenty pounds. Stay D S M. So greeting guys. Tissues is a book. Oh, you sent me the message, right? You sent me the message earlier. I told you, so we gotta big up this book because they've got a book on mental health, right? Yes. Um, and it's called Tissues, a book of life and poetry, tackling mental health and various other issues, written by professional former professional boxer, former Southern Area champion, Daniel Mendez. So Daniel. Oh, Daniel, yeah, Daniel used to train in the gym with us. Okay, Daniel, even more so, because you know what, that money that you've taken there, I'm going to buy the book, and, Come on. and me and Tundi are going to review the book on the show, yeah. so I'm going to buy the book straight away. As, as, I, as I come off here, uh, I'm, going to go on, I'm going to go online and, and purchase a book, and I'm going to read that book. Um, thank you so much for the donation. Big up yourself, big up your chest. 
And let me just repeat. Oh, can we get that back on? I have to repeat it. You get it twice. Let me say it again. DSM, thank you for the 20 pounds, sir. The, the message says, greeting, guys. T-I-S-S-U-E-S. -S -S, tissues. A book of life and poetry tackling mental health and various other issues written by a professional boxer and former Southern Area champion, champion Daniel Mendes. And um, believe me, the way I'm so passionate about this and the way I'm thankful that boxers are highlighting and documenting what they've been through, it's a great thing. And, um, it, you know, it, it, knowledge is power. And if you share your experiences, you may be helping someone in ways that you could never imagine. So big up, Daniel. Uh, yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, very, very important. Somebody else, somebody, what was it? Um, was that Sammy Ali? Yes. They said, they said something as well, yeah. Sent two pounds. Listen, Sammy. Big up. School, big up. school, you know, 16 years old. 16 years old. Thank you so much. Thanks for considering my training Wilder proposal. That was yeah. really, I'm telling you that. <laughs> Let me tell you this. If 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 Deontay Wilder was around myself and Baba Tundi Ajay, licking uh -huh. pants with Tundi Ajay and getting the knowledge from the knowledge, I that's guarantee right. you that he'd be undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Come on, that's a big statement, bro. I've said it. I've said it. Come on. I, mean, I love that. I'm love that. This now. So, Sammy, Mr. Ali, big up yourself. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Yes, sir. Big up, Sammy. Um, again, you know, where K Smith says mental health is rife in my community, uh, which is Manny Moss side, Manchester Moss side. Thank you for speaking out. Too many don't, and too many don't love every time. Big up, K Smith, all day. You know, what? You know go, on. go on. I don't know. You. Go no, on. I was saying it's so, it's, it's, it's something because I phoned someone today and, uh, I haven't spoken to my man Stevie G, stamina for soul trainer, for about a couple of weeks. And I just spoke about mental health. And within two minutes of the conversation, I said, Steve, let me phone you back. I phoned Spencer and Gary. Spencer told me he just received a message, a text, um, talking about someone that this show has helped get through mental health. And then Gary spoke about John Murray's cousin. So in the space of a two minute conversation, we came and we came up with the idea to have this show today. So it's quite obvious that it's a topic that is on everyone's mind. It, it is because I think, you know what, it's, it's kind of made it a little bit more easier to openly speak about it when you yeah. think um, the, the lineal Ring Magazine heavyweight champion of the world has openly spoken about um, um, the dramas that he's had with mental health, the issues that he's had with mental health. So it kind of makes it a little bit more easier now when we're saying, well, if somebody like him can come out and, and, and speak about these things, then it makes it, you know what I mean? It makes it, maybe it makes it a little bit more easier for other people to speak about. Because there's loads of people that, that certain things can happen to you that, that bring out, you know what I mean? That bring it out. What's that? Corgill. Ah, this guy. Let me just pick up this guy, yeah? Um, this guy is always supporting. Always Corey Gill. Yeah, always supporting. I remember I gave him a shout on Instagram. So, bless up for jumping on, on the thing. Yeah, I'm saying, like, sometimes when we see guys, but it's not. What we should be doing, we should be openly speaking about these things. When you openly raise certain things for debate, then it makes it more easier. And it, and the thing about it is this, a lot of people will try to hide about the mental health issues or they could be going through certain things because they're thinking, well, if I speak about it, it shows a weakness. No, if you speak about it, it shows incredible bravery. And strength. That's where the power is. There you go. There you go. Um, James Douglas said, this is great, guys. I know you both get some backlash, mostly most mostly jealousy. Does it affect? Oh, this is great. Does it affect all your families? And how do you deal with it? Uh, this is to both of you, Spence. You answer that first. 
All right, I'm gonna tell you this now, right? Um, I keep on saying this: the people who 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 give the stick, number one, they don't know me. Cause if you knew me, you'd love me. I'm just being, I'm being, yeah. right? So they could uh, have a, a a misquotation of my personality. That's not my problem. That's there you. you. Go. That's you can't comprehend the energies that I'm on. And when mm. they get to the level of what I'm on, where my energies are, then you'd have to love me. That's number one. Number two, everyone turns around and says haters are motivators. <laughs> no, sir. They're not. <laughs> Come right. on. If, if you're hating on me, that's not motivation for me to do better. Because therefore, then I'll be feeding off of your hate. Oh, my goodness gracious. Chris, Mr. Sheen. Listen, Chris, hey, what, this guy's a very, very good impressionist, right? Bro. This guy okay. is a very good impressionist. Go follow him now on, he's doing lots of sketches and all the rest of it. And he has openly spoken about his mental health issues that he's had in the past. Yeah. And you know what? He's conquering these mental health issues. And you know how he's doing it, Tim? He's conquering the mental, he's conquering the mental health issues um, um, by doing comedy, by doing stand-up sketches. I'm by looking for his messages, literally. I'm going to carry him. Bro, I'm telling you, he's my guy. Big up for the, for, the, for the donation. Anyway, I'm trying to say to you this. My motivation comes from the fact that my mother is 87 years young and still alive. My motivation comes from I have four beautiful children. I have a beautiful missus. I've got a lovely... That's my motivation. And my motivation is for them. My motivation is to know that my... I love... No, Tony can tell you. I love for my brother what I love for myself. That's the key. Right? That's the key. And, right? And I can't give any form of... And before I used to give it energy. That's years ago. Um, listen, I'm saying I'm really happy with my life. I'm really happy with everything that I've done and the things that I've... The things that I've achieved, the things that I'm yet to achieve, and the things that keep on pushing me forward. And even more so, I'm telling you this now, my brother's wins are my wins. When I see Tundi with his big gold chain, that's my gold chain. <laughs> Go this is how my mindset is. Because I, I, I understand this. Like, when you are happy for somebody else's success, yours is just around the corner. Yes, sir. Yes, that's sir. how the thing goes. A lot of people don't understand this, right? I remember, let me, this is the next thing that was deep. I remember the night that, that Dylan White got knocked out by Povetkin. And me and Tundi were watching the fight together. I was in my house. He was in his... And Tundi cried, and it wasn't it, the scream of the cry, yeah, was as evidential to me that Tundi's of the same mindset that you have to love your brother, what you love for yourself. Mm. Now, when you think about these things of like these people who are showing the stick and all the rest of it, it doesn't bother me because they don't know the things that I do. I don't need to, I don't need to say, like, I don't need pats on the back for the things that I do within the community or the people that I help or the rest of it. Anybody who really knows me knows my heart's massive. I'll give away my last because I understand the universal laws that as soon as you open your hand out and you give, you leave a space for yourself to receive. Come on. Loads, loads of people aren't giving. So they <laughs> not giving and they're not giving. The reason why, because they believe they have nothing to give or they believe that what they're holding on to. You know, the craziness is this. What was it? It was Buddha that said, like, revenge is like holding on to a hot, cold stone, thinking that it's going to affect the other person. Mm, your, kid. Right, your things don't affect me. I'm around positive people. Me and Tony speak right throughout the day about eight times throughout the day. At least. At least. Do you know what I mean? And everything is always, we're always laughing. Crack a joke. Right. Laughter <laughs> is key. Right. Even when things are going wrong. And That's certain true. Right, seriously, and you got luck. Even when people are trying to trying to twist things and all the rest, yes. of it, just yes. like right on judges' scorecards, Anti Yard came second best against Lyndon Alpha. Right, mm. my text to Kobe was just keep working. Simple. That's the that's what I got. Right, and Tony's reply to me was, "What do you think you have to tell me that?" <laughs> Come on. Right. So, like I'm saying, sometimes. The so-called hate, and everybody's brave over on Instagram. Everybody's brave over on Twitter because you know what? You, you think like, oh, I can be brave over this. Like, we're not going to see you. Like, we're so high, we're not going to see you. 
Now I'm going to tell you a story of um, some guy who was making videos and it was torrid abuse towards me. Torrid abuse towards me, right? Leon Figures, big up yourself, man. Sorry, Features, big up yourself. I'm saying, yeah, torrid it's figures. It's figures. Right. It was, it, was, it was torrid abuse towards me, right? And by chance, I happened to buck this boy at Joshua Watson's first professional fight, right? And it was Lyndon Arthur and Pat Barrett's nephew, Zelfa Barrett, that stopped me from punching this guy's lights up. <laughs> Come on. No, I was gonna punch him up. And the, and the thing about it is this this boy was talking the most wicked, foul, putrid stuff, spitting it all out. Only getting 12 views though, right? About me. I'm this, I'm that, I'm an Uncle Tom. And then but then he said something about my mother. All the rest of the stuff, I can take it. I don't worry about that. My missus said, I didn't take it, I didn't take it. Those things are not mine. But bro, when I heard that. When he said, ah, oh, he said, that I'll go suck your mum. Bruv, I was at the boxing, EJ Boxing Live. He was sat with so I said, who's that boy? He goes, oh, bro, that's the, that's the you. I ain't going to call you because he's irrelevant. I said, oh, okay. I said, my boy, come here, come here. What? What are you saying now? If you saw, the boy was darker than you, Tun. Right? <laughs> Tundi, he went white like my football. <laughs> bro, we put your nasty foot on the team. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Send donation, need cash, right? So, <laughs> what? But and then what do we do? The guy started to make videos apologizing, da, 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 and all the rest of it. So, I'm this. What this? What I'm saying is this: It's like sometimes the people that are showing you the hate, the majority of the time, is confused admiration. Yes, sir. They want to love you. They really want to have a crew of guys around them saying lions in the camp. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They really want to have a crew of guys around you say, we don't get weak. They really yeah, want they, they, I'm telling you, they really want that. They really wish that they, they were, that they had that form of confidence. It's not cockiness. It's confidence. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? As what's the great quotation by Mr. Garvey, where he says, without confidence, you're twice defeated in a race of life. But with confidence, you've won even before you've started. So... Mm -hmm. When they see somebody um, being exuberant with confidence, they cannot comprehend it because they lack that which you have. So therefore, there are no haters. It's energy. And I've got love for everyone, good or bad. Yes, sir. That's James Douglas, opinion. I'll answer that because I was just sitting there listening to my brother Spencer Fearon. He, he really said it all. But with me, <laughs> let me tell you something. If you look up in the sky and you see the birds flying, you can't touch them. <laughs> you can't touch no birds in the sky because they're out of your reach. And that's how I see myself with negativity. Come on, Bobby, right? Yep. Ah, oh, Bobby, he's always doing it. Oh, time, Bobby. Come on. The one and only Bobby, right? Guys, I've got to catch up with this tomorrow. I'm on my dad duty. Come on. You see what I'm saying? But he's still donating to the cause. Cool. And, um, much love, Bobby. Much love, Bobby. Um, so, yeah, so I was saying that the way I look at myself is that I'm just too high to be affected by negativity because I understand that nothing can exist without a positive and a negative. And I think when you understand that, you won't allow or you won't focus on the side that you're in no control of. I'm not in control of someone saying negative things about me. So why would I try to fight them? It don't make no sense. I'd rather spend time, spend my day speaking with positive people, speaking with people like Spencer Fearon, Gary Blake, Anthony Yard, Bilal Ali, and all my friends, you know, and that's what I live for. I live for people who are generally headed in the same direction as me and people that are above me that I can learn from. And so... The negative comments, really, I just laugh at them. There's a reason why I don't follow no one on social media. And it ain't because I'm cocky. It's because doing that, I only look at the things that I'm interested in. I don't want to see negative people's feeds coming on my thing all the time, talking nonsense. So I, I only tend to focus on positive things and positive people. And it's one of the reasons why I'm here 
talking about an issue or discussing an issue which affects a lot of people who can't openly speak out about it. And I think in doing that, I'm helping because another mantra of mine has always been givers gain. I'm going to say it again. Givers gain. And that's what we're about. We're about giving good and receiving good. Talking positive and having positive things said about yourself. And as long as I stay in that mindset, I'm going to get what I deserve. And to be honest with you, not only do I want for my brother what I want for myself, oft times as a teacher, as a mentor, and as someone who is a giver, I want more for my brother Come than on. I got for myself. Come on. I want more. Spencer's driving some big Range Rover right now. <laughs> and bro, I'm like, fam. Sorry, stop saying fam to me. I'm like, I feel so good for him because I know what he's gone through. I know the kind of heart this man has displayed over the years. I've never heard anybody call Tunde Jai's name in such a positive way as my brother Spencer Fearon. And I feel that that's part of the reason why he can never be alone, why he can never focus on negative stuff and why good things will always come to him. Just be positive, people. And if you don't have the confidence to be openly positive, latch on to people that are positive. And that's the key. So I know John Murray soon coming this thing, but let's get back to uh, hey, Norman Barton, big supporter. Big up Norman, come on all day. Keep negative people in your prayers. Not in Not your life. In your life. Great. <laughs> I don't keep in my prayers, bro. Uh, Ella, let me just tell people this now. Norman Barton is one of the realest brothers. You think anyone can talk any rubbish about me on Twitter? He's fighting my battles for me. Nah, I, love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. You know what? You know what they were. You know what they were saying. Uh, so John Murray's there, but before we bring John in, the great John Murray, I remember watching this kid, bro. I'm like, fam, this guy is a serious young prospect, and I can't wait till he, he joins us all. But this is a a good preamble before bringing in John. Spencer, six million people in England currently are receiving antidepressants three months to three months to September. Part of a wider trend and a higher, the highest figure on record. Lucy Sean Gavel, the deputy campaign campaigns director at the mental health charity, rethink said there is no support said said being sub, sub, sorry being sub, subscribed prescription with no support adding that such medications should go hand in hand with therapy and this is one of the things we were saying mental health campaigner natasha Deron devon said people are going to their gps with symptoms of mental illness and being sent away with a bag of medication, having been put on a waiting list for 18 months. Now, the, the part what touched me is that people are going to the doctors saying they're depressed, being given these medication, but not being given no advice, no caring. There, there ain't no therapy and no talking. You're just giving them tablets. Yep, 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 And, yep, and yep. how can you just, you know, people need help. They need shows like this. They need ex-boxers like John Murray to come and talk about stuff like this alone with the medication. And so it's incumbent on each and every one of us to share our stories if we've overcome the mental depression and come out on the other side. And I think on that note, we've got no better way to introduce him. Spence, I want you to introduce John Murray, please, I beg. Let's bring in former English lightweight champion. Let's bring in former British lightweight champion. Come Let's on. bring in former European lightweight champion. And the man that fought for the WBA vacant <laughs> title 
lightweight championship, none other than my brother from another mother. Come on. John okay. Murray. <laughs> John, man, you're looking like some doctor. Doctor, We're going to call you Dr. John Murray now. Yeah, so on. <laughs> So how are we uh, doing, Joe? After, after, but oh, good, yeah. Working hard in the gym, but it's hard with this lockdown at the minute. It's uh, trying to keep focus, but it's not a lot you can do. Is like, um, so I'm just, I'm giving myself a little tasks every day, just to keep myself busy. So every day I get up, I, I set my dog for a walk, I get a training session knocked out, I make sure I have a shower, I go, I go get my food that I need for the day, I cook myself, pre I prep, and eat, eat right foods every day. And just little things like that. And then at the end of the day, I judge how successful my day was by how many of these little tasks that he achieved. So it don't have to be big, massive things, but just little things like taking the dog for a walk, getting up and having a shower and just all little things like that. But at the end of the day, I judge the success of each day that I've had by how many of these little tasks that I've done. So today, like I said, I'm going to clean the gym. So I've blitzed my gym so it's nice and tidy, as you can see. <laughs> Go nice and tidy. So Love. Not many people here now, but so I'm just giving myself little tasks each day to keep myself busy. And uh, yeah, it works, it works, it keeps me happy, keeps me um keeps me focused and gives me a little bit of something to work towards. And I think in these times where the lockdown's on and not you're not busy in the gym because like, we've been locked down, you can't train anyone. So I'm just looking for little things each day to keep myself little tasks and it helps with my men mental state of mind just Achieving these little things and setting these goals and achieving them, it does. Um, John, let me let me just ask you. I mean, you know, you were quite successful, very successful as a as a professional fighter in this country. But after your career was over, do you feel that there could have been more support for you in dealing with? Because I know that you know most of these young kids who you know come up from the amateur scene and turn professional you know boxing is their focus and after boxing goes do you feel there could be more support for fighters definitely it got, um the way the way it worked with me is that like i was a big star i was doing well i felt i've made to feel like a celebrity and um the money was okay and uh, you know but once i retired and lost and my last fight was done six months after I retired. The money had gone from boxing. And Come on. all of a sudden, like, when you're boxing, your phone's going. You have 20 calls a day checking in how you're doing and stuff like that. But once you retired, it's like no one phones you anymore. You're just left on your own. And you dedicate your whole life to being a boxer. So from being 14 up to being 31, 32 when I retired, I was always sort of being taken care of, looked after and... They retired from both. So you cut out there a bit there, John. Hello? You gotta mute there, John, a little bit. Can't hear, can't hear you at all. Hello, John? You can't hear you, mate. No sound, John, no sound. So I'll produce yeah. if you could send John a message that we can't hear him. Yeah, can't, can't hear you. Can't hear you, John. Maybe he's put it on mute himself. Yeah. You... Yeah. Um, before John comes back on, one of the points, look at that. You heard what he said, Spence. He said six months after his career had finished, the money was gone. That's mad, isn't it? The money was gone. And, you know, what I want to ask, John, is was there any financial advice for you? You know, you know, did you have any help? You know, because boxing, as we know, and as he knows, that is a short career. And, you know, you want to at least finish, you know, when you've made money, you know, how much advice was there for him after? Because all these things attribute to um, your mental health. John, you there? Same still, on mute. still can't hear you. No sound. Yeah, yeah. All these things attribute to your mental health. And the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we're in lockdown now, you know, a lot of fighters who haven't even been in John's position are literally in the same position. 
So not only uh, have you, you ain't earned no money, but now you focus all this energy on boxing, boxing, boxing. Now all of a sudden, you don't know, you know you're not fighting in January. You, the likelihood is you're not fighting in February. They're talking about lockdown to the end of March. So you're talking April. Yep. And so for the next three months, these young men have to try and work out ways how to keep their minds occupied. And it's great that John's coming in there. And I love that, you know, setting little... You there, John? So, sorry, have you got me there? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah can now we can hear you. Can you, you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah, it yeah, you're you dead. Yeah, yeah, we got you then. Yeah, so what I was saying is like, so when I, when I was boxing, I was doing well, but it's like the day I stopped boxing was the day the phone stopped ringing and I was 31, 32, but I dedicated my whole life to being a boxer. So I had to sort of find my way and it was a tough time in my life and I struggled because um, obviously when you're a boxer, you, you get up, you do your run, you go home, you eat, and then you get up, you go to the gym, you go home, you eat, and you know where you're going to be and what you're supposed to be doing, but... Once I retired, it was it was a tough time because I dedicated my whole life to being a boxer. And once I retired, it was like, what do we do now? And there's no no support for boxers. So in football, they've got like the PFA. So the out footballers have to retire from being a footballer. But in boxing, there's nothing. And it was like all of a sudden, like you're not getting no tickets to no shows, and you're not going to no shows. And it's like you're having to rediscover. You like I was a 31 year old school leaver, just rediscovering myself and find out yes. what I was going to do next and it was a tough time of my life but luckily for me I, I used my last payday and I bought a gym and set up a gym and got back into the boxing and kept myself busy but I do know a lot of fighters that struggle with it and like I said the money from boxing what I had was was gone after six months and then I had to go and get a job working on the roads and that and stuff like that. It, it is tough for boxers and I don't think there is enough support for fighters once they retire from boxing because like I say, the tech, what they're doing is they're taking these young kids from the amateurs, they're turning pro and they're making them feel like stars. But boxing, unless you're like Floyd Mayweather, you're not really making life-changing amount of money. And then it's good while you're boxing if you do well. But in the end, your money, you're not, you're not, you're not, I don't think there's no financial support for you either. So the money that I made from boxing, I, I probably could have set up some something or other so that when I retired from boxing, I had a little nest egg or something to fall back on. But because of the way it is, it's like you get paid, you you do what you're doing, you've got loads of friends, you t you're looking after a lot of people, and then you think, right, money's getting low, I'm going to go and have a, another fight now. You go and have another fight, and then you get paid again. But you're not really looking after your money, so there needs to be something put in place as well, I think, like to help fighters know what to do with money, because... I'm from a council estate, so when I'm getting big paydays, stuff like that, it's like it was like a party for me, but it's a party for everyone else as well. And I'm looking Come at Come on, so. I'm talking. It's not. It's sorry, not John. Sorry, I'm getting. I'm getting. I'm getting, I'm getting emotional. John. People around me don't really know what to do with money, so you can't really set anything up. We're not. We're not from them them sort of backgrounds where people know what to do with, with stuff like that. So I think like every time I had a title fight, realistically I should maybe buy a buy to let house or something and then have a little bit of money for myself and, and then by the time I finish boxing I've had ten title fights, I've got ten buy to let houses. So I'm making money without doing any work. You know, boxing has set up that business for me after but it's hard. It was hard and it has been a, a journey for me retiring from boxing and coming on to this other side. I'm happy to say that I set up the gym, I set up my business, but it was tough. Um, and then now this corona, it's a tough again for everybody. It's tough for everyone. Everyone's in the same boat with that one, aren't they? So it's, it is tough for fighters. And I do think there should be more support for them to know what to do with the money, to know how to look after themselves. And also, when you retire from boxing, just, just like in the PFA, if they put people through educational courses and train them to do this job or that job so they can always fall back on something after they've retired there's, there's a fund there so maybe like when you're fighting there, there should be a percentage of your wage goes into a, like a boxing union and then yes, at the sir. end of your career the union helps you set up what you got to sell or push through a course train you to be a plumber or whatever so you can get a job after you retire from boxing because mm. 
you invest your whole life into being a boxer, you're not planning on life after boxing. And I don't think there's anything in place for boxers when you retire. It's like I've seen fighters, good fighters, good friends of mine from Manchester. And I know a lot of top class boxers have struggled after they retired from boxing and there's not anything really in place for them. So people will help them, but there's not any real help for them. You, you, you take kids and you, you make them be boxers, but at the end, when you retire, you're like a 30-year-old, 35-year-old school leaver and you just happen to rediscover yourself and find out where, where you can go in life. This, uh, this is Spence. There's is so much that we can touch on and we will touch on and what John has said. But first of all, John, I just want to thank you for coming on here and really having the bollocks, and I'm going to swear. I don't know, bollocks might not be swearing, but <laughs> having the bollocks. Be real and be open about it. Coming here and be so transparent. And I, I really applaud you for that, brother. And um, what I would say is boxers who are currently on this show you need to listen to this man's words because I remember when the phone was ringing, when John, when everyone was talking about John Murray, even down south, you know, here in London. Bro, and, uh, that Jonathan everyone, Fraxton fight, the Jonathan Fraxton fight. Yes. Because that was kind of like Jonathan's last hurrah, right? Mm. I remember um, there was some media thing going on there and Jonathan Fraxton came down to the Royal Fight Club. And like I was saying, yeah, you you, you got you got the John Murray fight, and I said to practicing like, yeah, I mean, yeah, um, how you getting in that fight? And he goes, we mean how I get on that fight? When I get, on, he was so adamant that he was gonna win. John was very, he comes across very mentally tough. Yes, I was saying to John, I said, bro, I think at that time Jonathan was working with Graham Everett, right? Yes, I was saying, I don't think you realize what kind of demon that John Murray is. I remember seeing John Murray fight, I think with, with the fight that was the Lee Luger fight. Yes, yes. And the hooks that you were throwing in that fight, John, I was like, this guy is a terror. <laughs> I mean, this guy Sorry, is I'm a terror. I'm talking to you, it's breaking up a lot. I can't, I can't really understand what you're okay. saying. I'm not, getting, I'm not getting a good feed for the sound. Uh, so unfortunately, no, I was just saying, you um, when I saw you against Jonathan Fraxton and Lee Mega, I knew yes. you was a real, I knew you was, you was a dog's bollocks, mate. Yeah, 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 good, good performance. But, but you know, yeah. John, John, I, can I ask you a question? I, like, you know, it, I mean, the, the first thing that stuck up, stuck in my mind was the fact that you said that six months after you had finished boxing, uh, your money was gone. And um, obviously, I agree because I've come up the same way, council estate, and what have you. But do you think that when you get to a certain level in the sport, you know, automatically, do you think the onus is on the people around you to advise you? Because I mean, you had a trainer, you had a manager, you had a promoter. Do you think that there should have been, because I know how I am, and maybe. I'm one out of a few. But the first thing I'm telling my guys when they get money is buy houses. I'm advising them. I'm telling them, you got your money, you put this to one side. <coughs> and and because I remember, you know, when someone's training, you ain't just coming to the gym every day, do your work, spar and everything. You're both earning and learning together. So there must be at some point that the people that are around you, that people are set up to protect you in your career, should say to you, oh, John, what are you doing with your money? Don't you think they should do that? Because as you said, you come into the school as a young man, you just want to fight. You just want to fight. And, and I put it on myself to advise all my guys that look, this career short, if you happen to make money, Let's bank it. Let's be smart. Let's make smart investments. Do you think the people that were around you had an onus on you to, to advise you properly? Yeah, so this is what I'm saying. So I, th I think there should be some sort of boxing union or something where fighters can 
the even take a percentage of your wage, or there's no real structure in it. So, like, when I first turned pro, I was 18 years old. So when I started making money, it was I was like young, and like all oh, my mates yes. are at union. That's so they're not really making any money. It's like I'm getting big paydays, and it's like I'm looking after loads of people and taking them all out and stuff like that, and going on holidays and stuff like that. But I've got loads of money, so I'm 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 having to carry quite a few people with me, but. It's not their fault. It's it's not really anyone's fault. But it's just that you're young and you, you boxes is is a young career. And it, it's over before you know it. So when you're fighting, you don't think it's ever going to end. You think fight, get paid, and then once that money's gone, you think money's getting low. But I need another fight, so you get into another fight, you get paid again. But you're not really looking after your money. You're just enjoying life with it. And it needs to be some sort of structure or someone around you or some boxing union or something that you can help you look after your money a bit better so let's say you get 20 grand for the fight they might go well you will take five grand of that fight and that's going to go into an investment for you now so you're going to get this x amount of money out of that five grand now for the rest of your life so then you can pay it in, into that union after every fight and then at the end of your career you might end up with so much investment into it but you're making like two three hundred quid a week for the rest of your life, then you've invested, let's say, you put 50 grand into the union, you're making 300 quid a week or 200 quid a week, just so you've got something back and you're investing in something, yes. in something you get, you're getting something back out of boxing then for the rest of your life. So it was like, I remember when I was doing well, I had lots of friends and managers, promoters, and people like that. But they would pick up the phone all the time, they'd always check on me, see how I'm doing. But the day I retired and the day my boxing career was over was the day the phone stopped ringing. And like, I, I felt like I was a piece of me, even though I was made to feel like the start. At the end, I felt like it turns out I was just a commodity for the business. So I was just a piece of meat for the business. And there was lots of people making good money. For instance, like, I don't really want to slag anyone off or anything like that. But I boxed on a promoter show once and then three months later he asked for tickets for, for a fight a big fight on, on that same promoter show um and uh i got tickets off him i didn't have to pay nothing for them but when i went to the show took my girlfriend i thought oh i'm gonna go to the show went to the show at the arena you know, and i was on the top tier three rows from the very back is row in, in the arena and like wow. people going hi john you john when you, when you find uh in in the ring three months ago and i was like yeah but i was i was properly embarrassed because I was three rows from the back he's rolling the top is tear in, in the arena and I thought this is you know three months ago I was in I was in the ring fighting and now I've got tickets three months later and three rows from the back and that was because my career was over. If I was still fighting I would have been ringside with passes, you know what I mean? So that's that that it home for me. It made me realise how fickle it was and and what boxing was all about and stuff like that made me realise that once you're done, you're done. Once you're no use to the business, once that commodity is over and you can't fight anymore, you're no use to the business. Hence, <coughs> you, you don't need any special treatment. You don't need to be ringside. You don't. You, they, they'll palm you off with tickets, free rolls in the back. Is row in the arena. It's a, it's a twenty thousand seat arena, and I was on the top tier, free rolls from the very back. Is row in the arena. And I thought, and people were stopping me ask, asking, am, "Am I John Murray?" And I, thought, I, I was like, "Sugar, sugar, no, it's not me." You know what I mean? Because that's how embarrassed I was, but it, it's a horrible, horrible, brutal game boxing. And like, it's cost me an eye. I'm blind in one eye now, so I can't see out of one eye. And I thought, I've given an eye away for this. And six months later, I'm, I'm skin. I've got no money. I've asked for tickets for the show. I thought, I'll have a night out, go and see everyone at boxing, see some old friends and that, and just be around it. And then I've been palmed off with tickets, free rolls from the back of Roni Arena. It was. It it wasn't nice. It wasn't a nice feeling. Stuff like that affects your mental health. And I yes. with, with myself after boxing. It was hard because I had to come to terms with trying to rediscover who I am and what I'm about and what I'm going to do next. And I was always knew what I was supposed to do in life. And I, was, I knew I had to get up and do my training. Knew I had to go to the gym. But once once you retire, once it's done, dust. It's like, what do you do now? And there's, there's no help and no guidance for fighters out there. You've got, like, I've got friends in boxing we can always call, and I've got probably one or two people from boxing now, from my professional days, who pick up the phone and see how I'm doing. And uh, 
and that that's a small amount compared to how many people use use to always pick up the phone. So, like I say, I don't want to mention any names or slag anyone off because that's not what I'm here for. I'm just, I'm just explaining to it like young fighters are made to feel like stars, and the day you stop being an asset or stop being a commodity for that business, you're dropped. And and fighters need to understand this and. They need to be something in place or they need to have good people around them who are going to help invest into their future because boxing is a very short career, you know what I mean? So, it's tough. So, John, to any young fighter out there, John, what advice would you give them, like, to, to, to kind of help them stay clear away from that form of depression? Or also, if they're going through anything depressing, like they could be actively in the game or after they've retired. What advice would you give them, John? Sorry, mate, I missed that last bit. If you've gone through anything depressing, what? Yeah, if any young fighter was going through any form of depression, like during fighting or after fighting, what advice would you give them, brother? Um, I think it's important. I, I always say routines are key to happiness. And so when you're fighting, you've got routines in your life and you're busy. You know where you're supposed to be. Oh, supposed to be. Routines lead routines. to happiness. Yeah, routines are key to happiness in my eyes. So when you're fighting, you know what you got to do. You get up, you go running. You go home, you eat, you sleep. You get up, you go gym. You go home, you eat, you sleep. You know where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be doing. Once you've retired from boxing, that routine is out the window. You've got no routine to your life and you don't know what you're supposed to be doing or where you're supposed to be. So I think any young fighter coming through, I think, Find some routine and find find routine out, out out away from boxing as well. So if you can help yourself get a job or something for after you finish boxing, that's important because any fight there's very few fighters who make life changing amounts of money through boxing. Come so, on. Um John, it's, it's, you something that you just hit another a point there. I remember when I was coming up. It, you know, early as a trainer, and I remember um, Alan Smith, who's got a few good fighters around him now. He always used to say, uh, "All boxers should have a, a job." And at first, I, I've always been like, "Nah." To me, that don't make no sense. It's a hard sport. You got to focus on it one hundred percent. And I remember again, Mick Collier from the British Boxing Board of Control. Every time a boxer would go out for an interview to get a license, Mick Collier would say, have you got a job? And they would say, no. And he would say, we'll get one. You know, and we spoke about this. Mick Collier is a very wealthy individual, you know, uh, but he was advising boxers and basically telling them that you have to have something else other than just boxing. Because as you're saying now, it, it is very important to have that routine because it's part of, of your happiness. And, and you know, you're saying, you, you're giving us a lot of gems here, John. The, the, pr the problem is with boxing is, um, I think to have any, any success or get to an high level, you have to dedicate your whole life to being a boxer. So if, if you have a job and you box at the same time, it's tough because boxing takes a lot out of your body and it'll, it'll exhaust you. And then if you're going to work as well on top of that, I don't think you're going to get to the levels you're supposed to, but mm. I think it's good to have a backup. Always have a backup oh, yeah. plan. You know what I mean? I invested my whole life into being a boxer, so I, I turned pro 80. I thought, I'm going to be a boxer. I'm going to win titles. And I had the mindset to win titles, so I knew I would. I, I already knew what I was going to do before I did it, so I worked, I worked to graft it, but I didn't really have any backup plan. I didn't, I didn't plan on failing at what I did, but I think that's why yeah. I was so, so successful at what I did because I invested everything into it and I worked I worked my ass off to do it, but that's why I think maybe something like a boxing union where you can invest into something just in case it don't work out for you. And how many fighters are going to make life-changing amounts of money through boxing? I, I don't think there's many. There's only no. a handful of people can do that. So it is tough, but... Maybe a boxing union, I think, would be a good idea. Yes. Spence? Yeah. Um, just like what John's saying, I'm going to reiterate that. Where he's saying it's only a small handful. It is 3% of boxers. It's 5% of boxers that earn enough money to give up their day job, if they've got a day job. 
it's three percent that make life changing money. You mean three percent? Uh you think about it, out of the thousands upon thousands of boxers globally, three percent can actually say they sold off into the sunset. Three percent. That's no so, comparison. So John, you know, again, you were saying it that you know. When you're winning and you're up, the phone's ringing and stuff like that. But you know, being on the other side now, as a as a trainer, you know, and 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 the position where we're all in at the moment with this lockdown period, I know even me managing fighters, I'm trying to work on my own mental health. Hmm. So you you know, like now you've got a situation where you got these fighters that you you look after. But now is it is it a case where you have to phone them every day because you know you know what it's like to be alone, to be a fighter, and now not being able to go anywhere and do anything. How are you handling with that? Handling that? Yeah. I think I think like because I've been through it, I don't want them fighters to go through what I went through. So I'm always very aware of when fighters get paid, what they do with the money. I ask them what they're doing with the money and I try and help and advise them and uh, as, as well, I check in on them as well. So, like, I think I've got a lot. All my fighters will phone me all the time. If anything going wrong in their life, they'll phone me and I'll always be there for them because you are like a father figure to fighters because in the end, the fighter will spend more time with you than they'll spend with their own family. So they're in the gym with you six days a week. So you become like their father in, in, in a way. And my training was, was like my father. But obviously things happened. It didn't work out, but when that was taken away from me and that relationship was lost, it was heartbreaking for me because I had no one, no one real male role model, a grown, an older person than me to fall back on. And I struggled with like finding my way, but knowing what to do with myself. And it was tough, but I'm happy to say I did find my way out in the, in the end. It was, I found my way in the end, but other fighters I know from Manchester and big names, and they've struggled. Um, uh, I know Ricky Atten, obviously, he, he done well. He done well out of boxing, but people that don't do as well as Ricky Atten, so they ain't got that nest egg of money to fall back on, and they've struggled, and they've, they've ended up with nothing. I don't want to name any names because I don't want to do that. But <laughs> no, you don't need to. You think, ah, oh, wow, how have you ended up like this? And why, yes. why no one got grip of you? Why no one helped you? Because. At one time, they, 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 they was walking to somewhere and they, they made out like gods. Even I'd look up to him because he was my, the, my idols when I, when I started. I look at him and think, wow, there's him. He's, he's like a god. And he looks like a big star. He's like a celebrity. And then five years after he's retired, you look at him and think, wow, what happened to you? Where was he out? Where was the support? No one's helped him. Yeah. No one supported him. And how many fighters do you find out um, was doing really well? Big stars. And then at the end of boxing, they turn into alcoholic. Yes, sir. Kevin, oh, we've lost the sound again. We've lost the sound, John. From boxing, they turn yeah, into. Um, you got me. Yeah, you got me. Yeah, I got you now. I got you now. Yeah. Um, Kevin Cooper asks a question, John. He says, "How how did you feel when you felt when you felt that brain scan, John?" at a time that was so important for you in your career? And how has the loss in one eye affected your mental health? Right, it's gone again. Oh. Gary's gonna get on it, no doubt. Our producer, Gary. <laughs> yes, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this, is, this is gold, Spence. This it is, is gold. It is, and and um, I would say this is like John's saying the same thing that I was just saying earlier, like to get into a routine. Because when you're in a routine, you know the old adage that the devil makes work for idle hands. Yes, sir. Right? but it's only idle hands, but idle minds. Back now. Yes. Back, can we hear you now, John? You back, John? Sorry, I'm back. Keep yeah. Going. All right. Good stuff. So yeah. So, you know, how did you feel when you felt, when you felt that brain scan um, at a time that was so important for you in your career? And how has the loss in one yeah. eye affected your mental health? 
So I had, I had to fight with Mitchell. I had my first loss in my career. And then um, I got offered to redeem myself against Rios. And, I, and you know, I made some mistakes in camp. We had, me and Joe Gallagher had a fallout going into the Mitchell fight. So I had a really terrible camp going into that fight. And my mental state of mind wasn't, wasn't the best because me and George fell out and stuff like that. And, you know, it's no secret. Everyone knows I was on the piss before the Mitchell fight and blah, blah, blah. I got beat. But I got offered the Rios fight, a chance to redeem myself going into um, after my first loss. So I trained my ass off. Me and Joe made friends and we had to go to camp, went into the Rios fight. And, you know, it was a good performance, but I lost the fight. But it's one of them things. And, you know, I, I could set the loss to Rios better than I could set the loss to Mitchell because I knew I let myself down going into the Mitchell fight. And realistically, going into that fight, people knew I wasn't right and Joe knew I wasn't right. But... They still let me go into the fight, even though I was 100% and I'd been messing about. But again, they should have pulled me out. People should look after the fighters better than that. And if, if someone's not right and, and rearing it, you need to be looked after because fighters are fighters. And I'll, I'll, take, I'll take any fight at any notice and in shape or out of shape, I'll get in that ring because that's my job and I'm a fighter. And I won't ever pull out of a fight because it's fighters' mentality. You know what I mean? I, I'm not backing out. I'm, I'm a fighter. I want to go and fight. But you need people to look after you and sometimes I think people might look at the, the money they're making rather than looking at the fighters mental health and checking how he is. How, how's, how's John? How, how are you doing, John? You know what I mean? It's like, don't matter how John's doing, he's going to make us money in this fight. Now it's, it's a payday for us, but it, boxing is boxing. And then after I lost them two fights and then the next thing, I had a year off, I was going into Gavin Reese fight and then, a week before the Reese fight, that's when I fell my brain scan and kept me out of the ring again. So I had two years out of the ring, but them two years out of the ring was really, really tough for me. And I struggled massive with, with my mental state of mind. I was I was severely depressed and um, I had a lot of bad things happen to me. And it all, all added up and no one picking up the phone no more. I was phoning people, no one wants to speak to you no more. And it's tough. And you need what you need as a fight life. You need a good network of people around you. you. Need the right people around you. Some people are there for the fame. Some people are there for the money. But some people are there because it's a journey together. You win together and you lose together. And Come them, on. Them people are good trainers, and that's what I want to be to my my fighters. I want to be that that guy they can lean on because I've been through them tough times. So I don't want anyone to suffer like I suffered. So I know what it feels like to be on your own. So. I always go above and beyond for my fighters and even if they stop boxing and they're having a hard time, they can always pick up the phone to me and they can always come down. I'll say, come down have a session with me. Training train helps with your mental state of mind as well. So if I'm having a down day, I'll get in the gym and I'll work out a session. And you know what? I feel brand new. And if it, all them obstacles that was in the way before, I'm seeing solutions now instead of, instead of doors closing, doors are open. I think, well, you know what? That didn't work out, but I can do this now. I mean, I think training is really important for people's mental state of mind also. So, working out a session can help if you're feeling a bit down. Fantastic. This is... Spence, well, I can talk all day to Joe because, you know, having that kind of experience and not wanting uh, someone that you're looking after to go through is key. And, you know, it is that, you know, someone has said, I think it was Kirk Campbell, said the right team is key. And that's yeah. right. That's right. You have to have people around you. And so, you know, you young fighters, pick your trainers wisely, pick your network wisely. And, um, you know, it, it's down to you to really, I mean, obviously, if you're young like John was, you really don't know what's going on because, you know, so I, I would always say, if you, you know, a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, you know, your father you know, the father's messing up or the father's getting in the way of business. Sometimes your father could be a saving grace, you know, because really? he has been through things that you haven't been through. And as as John said, only a few percent of people actually make enough money to, you know, go on and have a life after boxing. And so, yeah. and so John being back in the sport, and giving this kind of advice and knowledge and sharing his story again, John, I just want to salute you for that um, because it's needed. It's, it's needed. It's needed. And and well, you've got a new. You you. I was always a fan of yours when you're fighting, 
But just as a, a, a man and a, um, as someone that's involved in the sport now, I'm definitely 100% going to be supporting you and what you're doing. Um, and I just want to thank you, John, for having the, the nuts yeah, and guts I, to come over here and speak. I think it'd be good as well if like, we could get something to, together for, for like Xboxes. So like, if you've got like, a load of Xboxes together... And, um, We're gonna do that. Maybe one year, like an Xboxes do or something, it's where young fighters can come because you can pick up a lot of experience from old people that have been before you and old ex champions and listen to their stories and sharing their stories would help young fighters. Well, you really know what I mean? So I well, speak to young fighters sometimes. He asks me for advice and I'll speak to him and I'll tell my stories and I'll I'll explain to him like, don't think like that's it. Now you've made it. You know what I mean? You've got to get to the gym, you've got to do them runs, you've got to graft all the time, because once you've once you've lost, boxing changes and things are different if, if you're not constantly winning. Once you stop winning, life mm. will change, and it's, it's good to hear them stories, because I'd like to I'd like, I'd like to know then what I know now. You know what I mean? Because mm. things would have been different. I'd have looked after, after things differently. I'd have done things differently. Because what is when you're a boxer, you just think, Right, I'm winning, have another fight, win, have another fight, win, and then you don't ever think it's going to end. You, you live in like a, a bubble where you think this is never going to end, but you're not planning on the future because you're enjoying the moment and you're not you're not really thinking if something goes wrong because that's not your, your mindset. You're thinking everything's going to go right all the time. I think to be successful, you have to have that mindset, but I think you need someone around you and you need experience and stories who can tell you. What happens if it don't go right? What happens if it don't go the way you, you're planning? What's the next move just in case it don't go right? And it, I think young fighters need to hear these stories because it will help them make the right decisions going forward. Like, there's no substitute for experience, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, um, Boxing Sweet Science 2.0 says, I see that all the time. I saw Joel Judah. I was on the floor and he was in the stands talking about the time when you said that just after one of your fights, when you retired from the game, you asked the same promoter for tickets and they gave you a ticket up in the gods. And I've seen that loads of times. Um, um, loads and loads of times. And it's like, it's, 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 it's crazy how that, how that pans out. It's crazy how the, the value of a fighter. Sometimes a fighter gives away their value because promoters will be the main base. They'll be there for 10, 20, 30 years. A fighter's career, you're lucky you get 10 years. 40 years, certain promoters. 50 years, certain promoters. How long has uh, uh, Bob Aaron been in the game? So how many fighters have been through in and out of his hands has been, it's been unreal. And it is, it's like, as soon as you, you, you retire from the, from the sport, unfortunately, you know what I mean, as Apollo Creed says, like an ancient history, right? I, and think, it's I think what John is saying is that if young fighters know this, especially because of, you know, John's coming in and speaking of his experience and him yeah. even making this question, him making the suggestion that, you know, we should do that. ex fighters, trainers, managers, we should get together and hear the stories. And, and, you know, if you've got that history, the chances are you won't make the same mistake again. Uh, but when you're going into something, having no history, no advice, no education, then you, you, you know it's going to come to a, a bad ending. So, again, I think what John is, the suggestions that John is making you know, the union suggestion, the fighters coming together suggestion are real, real great points. Um, David E asks, what's your brother Joe up to now, John? Um, Joe's the one. He, he struggled with boxing because obviously he went to the Olympics. He won a bronze medal at the World Amateur Boxing Championships and uh, he was doing all right. But then Joe, Joe Gallagher and... Joe's promoter at the time had fallout, so he's keeping him out of the ring for, for a long time. And he think he won't get in many fights, and he, he was struggling like to make a living out of boxing in the end. So he's end up um, he's over in Chester now. He's doing well. He's happy enough. He's got a missus and that. He's bought an house. He's uh, 
he's he's a thing's doing taxi driving now, but he's happy. He's got a steady wow. wage. He's, he's making money. He's, he, he, in the end for him, because he was on ticket deals towards the end of his career, he's like, he was selling as many tickets as he could, paying his promoter, paying, paying the opponent, and then sometimes he'd go in the ring and he was making 30, 40 quid. You know, as a professional yeah. fighter, a ticket deal at Joe's level, you, you can't go into fights not making any money, but you do, you, you do that sometimes because you think, you know, I'll get this fight, get this win, and then, you know, I'll get I'll get a bigger fight and get a bigger payday. But professional boxing, I don't think any professional fighter should ever get in the ring and not make a wage. And these ticket deals Trust sometimes, me. I've done it with a few fighters of mine who aren't sold enough tickets to make wages. So they're going into professional fights and they're doing it for free. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's not right. Boxing ain't right sometimes. And these ticket deals, I don't think should be right. I think, it, I think every fighter should make a, make a wage. If you're getting punched in the head, you need to be making money. And ticket deals are often sure. good, unless you can sell loads of tickets. But it's not always the case. It's hard sometimes for fighters to make money doing that. But you should never get in the ring and fight for free. And uh, that, that was happening a lot with some of the fighters. I was training on ticket deals. They couldn't sell enough tickets. The show weren't big enough. And it's tough for them to do it. And they make enough money to pay their opponent, pay the promoter, and they're left with nothing. So... <laughs> I don't know. There's loads, there's loads of things. That I don't like the way boxing has become lately, but and it has changed because the, the, the fighters do seem to be making more, more money. Eddie Yearns doing a fantastic job. I see I see his fighters are doing well and they're making good money, but I just see other fighters that on these little shows sometimes not making any money and boxing's changed. It's different now. It's not the same as it used to be. I think if you can sell loads of tickets, you'll get a good record and you'll get the opportunities and get fights with sometimes talented fighters aren't getting opportunities just because they can't sell tickets and it's becoming like um, a bit like WWF sometimes where they're having to slag each other off and blah 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 it's not really about the talent it's more about the persona and the characters that they're building up and the slagging off matches before and I'm not really about that because boxing's all about respect and I'd always shake my opponent's hand and wishing the best of luck tomorrow night and by the time the bell goes, you know, Psycho John comes out and we have a dick, good old-fashioned ding-dong, but... <laughs> Come on. Big and <laughs> yeah. Big each other and I'll take you for the pint of the bar, you know what I mean? But I don't like this uh, WWF mentality, what, what's coming out now, where it's all about, like, throwing chairs and blah, blah, blah. I know it sells tickets, but I just think boxing's not really about that. Boxing's not a wrestling wrestling sport, is it? It's not about... thingy, but it does sell tickets, so it is a business as well at the same time, so... I don't know. I just think some things need to change and something needs to be put in place for fighters before they retire. I think no fighter should go through the ring. So, like I say, boxing cost me an eye. And then what, once the day I hung up my gloves was the day no favours were done for me no more. And I lost an eye through boxing six months later. I think, was was it worth the money I made from boxing? It cost me an eye. And it's not. You can't put a price on, on your eye side. I mean, so I don't know. What, There's loads what, of things what, you go into boxing. Just is yes. what it is, though. No regrets. Uh, just is what it is. But that's what I move forward. And concentrate on making sure that my fighters don't make the same mistakes I made, and that yes. I'm in place to help my fighters. No matter what they go through, I'm always going to be there for them, and they're not going to suffer like I suffer because I've got this experience. So rather than focus on the negative of it, I'm going to focus on the positive of it. And, use my bad experiences to make sure my fighters going forward don't suffer the way that I suffered. Come so on. I can use it to, in a positive way. And that's what I want Absolutely, do. John. And, and that's, that's what we need. Yeah, see, we're touching yeah. on the positive, John. Like, apart from the fact, what would you say the thing that makes you most happiest now, John? Sorry, I missed that. What's the thing that makes you most happiest now? Sounds not good. Oh man! Yeah. He, said, he said, "John, he said, he said, you know, what? What would you say makes you the most happiest now? Uh, you know, it, it, it just in life. What makes you the most happiest? Is it is it training the fighters? Um, like I say, what routine is key to happiness for me? So, if I, I've set I set myself little tasks every day, as long as I get my training session knocked out. I long to get myself some good food to eat rather than eating takeaways and stuff like that. I like to go out, get ingredients and cook myself a 
nice clean food, some nice some nice good good meals rather than eating crap food. I'll have cheat days like everyone else does, but once a week I'll have a cheat day on a Saturday, and then uh, back to back to knuckling down. Oh, routine's the key to happiness for me. Once you lose that routine, you lose your happiness. It's all up in the air. So it's about being steady and being in a routine. I think any young fighter. Uh, Get them routines and get knuckled down and put your graft in, and you'll get the rewards you deserve. Well, John, listen, I don't want to hold you up no more because believe me, I think I personally can listen to you all day, you know. But I know you're a busy man, and uh, I just want to thank you for the the stories that you've shared. I mean, I see Jeffrey Hines is on here, who's a referee, and he's saying he's quite shocked to learn of the t about the ticket bills. Um, and again, I think, you know, your brother, you know, I, I didn't know that with your brother. And as you said, your brother won a bronze at the Olympic, at the World right, you know. And Joe was, you know, so just to hear that story and the fact that now he's, you know, he's doing cabin or something like that, again, is to highlight how serious this sport is and, and how we've got to share these stories uh, in this time here, so people know they're not alone, you know, because all of this affects mental health and how you deal with it. And it's great to see that you've dealt with it in a positive way and looking at it in a, as a, in a positive way and sharing your knowledge. Yeah. So that's all I would say, John. I thank you so much for your time, for your patience, and for your stories. Spence, thanks you want to say? I, Let's, I think Spence has got. Yeah, Spence has got. Yeah, man. It's, yeah. A, it's been a pleasure, John, man. Uh, I've, I've, you know what I mean, I've been ringside with quite a few of your fights, and and I keep on saying to people, it's not about being a champion in the ring; it's about championing life. And right now, my friend, you're championing life. So God bless you, my brother. Right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Boom. Lovely. Dream it, believe it, become it. And now we're gonna take. We're going to put these questions on the screen because we still got a few minutes of the show. And um, Spence, that was... I mean, I, I just got a message. Hold on. I have to read the message out. Me I've got bare messages from, from the show. Um, oh, my, my, my friend said, this is the best podcast on boxing I've ever watched, bro. So insightful, dealing with issues in boxing that no one covers. I watched John's whole career have fans, uh, and he gave fans a lot of entertainment. And you heard it. My brother is saying that this is the best show he's ever seen, the best podcast, because it's the realness. It's the realness. And um, uh, this is, this. I mean, I'm, I think I'm at a loss for words, because for a young man to speak like that, um, and really just let it all out, Spence, you know, um, well, I respect his openness. Uh, who was it that got the the got him on a Cooper in it, Mister Cooper, right? So we got to thank him for for arranging that for our through our producer Gary. Gary's trying to compete with Black Books with me now, right? Um, <laughs> yes. But like I'm saying, I'm I'm uh, I'm very very um, grateful and humbled by him coming on the show and and everything else and. Like, I'm trying to tell all these young kids who want to be in the boxing ring and all the rest of it that this sport is no joke, right? So what you can do, and, and the success is not necessarily the money, right? The success the success is coming out, out unscathed. And like I said uh, many a times, especially right now in the climate that we're in, that survival is the new success. So from once you... Once you wake up in the morning and you got a roof over your head and you're healthy, you got food on the table, you've won. Yes, Everything sir. Leon, else not matter. Yes. Leon Figures says, I'm sure I sound like I'm gassing your show up, but it's all truth. The levels of excellence on this show is unreal, Spencer. Well, you know what I'm saying? I'm 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 uh, I'm grateful for the for the pleasantries and all the rest of it. And I'm, I'm very grateful for it. But it's like, for somebody like John Murray to come and speak so openly. Candidly, trust. Right? right. And the next thing is like, we know how it goes. 
And it's, it's hurtful to me when I'm saying, like, a kid's just boxed and retired, and he's saying three months after retirement, he's asking for tickets, and they don't care. You're a piece of meat. And the thing about it is this, here is a man that, after he's just retired, so, you know what I mean, it's after the, 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 the Ramos fight, right? So, Rios, yeah, after, yeah, uh, after the, sorry, Ramos, Rios fight, after the Rios fight. So he's retired. He fought gallantly. He lost in the 11th round. He fought gallantly in that fight, right? Hmm. So after that now, he's gone back to a promoter that was promoting him, saying like, oh, if I get some tickets, have a night out. And a man put him in a ticket where you could have got nosebleeds up there. Now, wow. that, is, that is a liberty. Now, the thing about it is this, is like, regardless how big a show is or all the rest of it, show respect. Because I keep on telling people that life is not a line, it's a circle, you know? And I'm telling you this now, you may not, people may not want to listen to me, but I'm saying what goes around invariably comes around. There you right? go. So the same way you're treating man about you're giving man tickets up in the gods, believe me, you know, karma's a bitch and karma doesn't forget addresses neither. Hmm. You know what I mean? So then you like that bad energy, in return, that bad energy has to come back to sender, you know? I just need to realise that. Energy goes where energy flows. Sammy yep. Ali says, uh, better known boxers in different cities and towns should help sponsor promote their local small hall shows. Um, I mean, it's, it's it's always, you know, it's always a, about support. But, you know, I think John Murray said it, you know, no boxer should go in there and not get paid. No boxer. The fact that you're, 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 you're trying to sell these tickets... Then you're ending up, you know, you're ending up, uh, you know, paying for your opponent. And then you don't even get no money. You're paying the promoter. You don't even get no money. Like, well, it's, 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 it's a tricky one, Spence. It is a tricky one. I'm you know? tricky one. I'm promoted. I'm promoted. Nobody could tell around saying it's short by me. Ever. Yes. Maybe that's why I don't promote now. <laughs> yeah. um, you know how I roll. Yeah. So Rav, Rav 86 says the, the best show so far this week, a topic that is helping people, especially in lockdown, open and uh, open and honest. We're all learning. It's hurtful and that there is not financial educated. Hope this changes in the future. And, you know, as, again, you know, John said it. He come from the council estate. He's like, Bro, when he's earning his peace, he's taking out the whole council estate. So... Wow. No, oh, come on. In, in, in my, in my everybody in that situation. Everybody, but but the thing is, is that the fight is right. Spencer Freeman, Tunde Jai, and Gary Blake are bringing these boxers to speak about their experience and praying, hopefully, that younger boxers don't make the same mistakes. That's our contribution to the young ones coming out. Because you can't help everybody. That's just a, that's just how the thing goes. You can't help everybody. But what you can give is people education. What I was alluding to was the fact that he had got so far up. He, were, what, he was one of the few people that actually made money. And nobody around him advised him to invest. I don't understand that. I, I, and... I know what he's saying, it's nobody's fault really or anything, but nah, somebody has to be held accountable. It's somebody that's, I know my dad is always saying, uh, please advise your boxer, <laughs> advise your boxer, you know, invest the money, tell him to invest the money. You see what I'm saying? Because my dad knows how hard it is to earn money. So we have two kind of separate issues here. We have guys that are never going to make that kind of money Oh, my PC's running low. Let me put in the charger. One sec, man. Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, we have people, <coughs> boxers, that are never even going to make that kind of money. But then you would feel that when they are in that position, having so much case study, and past ex and seeing so many past or hearing about so many past experiences that someone would say to them like, oh, you got 50, 100K a year, invest the money. Mm -hmm. And is it because our sport 
is so undervalued and and uh, it isn't the sport of football or or it isn't the sport of I don't know cricket or tennis or anything. But what I do know is you can make more money on one night in boxing than any than any sport. But how comes it seems to me that over the years, you know, and John Murray spoke on it. He said that sometimes, you know, there were fighters that he's seen years later and he's like, how did that even happen to them? So I feel that us talking about this is really helping people and future generations and boxers that are coming up. Get the right people around you. Uh, if you don't have, if you can't afford to have the right people around you when you get to that level make sure you get the right people around you uh, because it will be a travesty to give have given your whole life to the sport of boxing and then not have anything to show for it that's just wrong spence let's get some questions up gal baz davis says are you guys planning to keep this format over lockdown it's a blessing in the evenings especially with the very topic spence answer that please and of course we're going to keep on going we started this week with it right and i'm grateful by from all the support and you people tuning in but you know what it is what's the quote it was charles swindon right that said life is 10 percent of what happens to you and 90 percent of how you react to it Come right on. But this lockdown, 90% of how you react to it. The 10%, we're not in control of that. We're not in control of this thing like you can't go this place or blah. You know I mean, you're reading on, you're hearing on the news that they're locking up people for coming out their house without any valid reason and stuff like that. You know what I mean, a lot of mind control and fear mongering. Right. So that's the 10%. So the 90% is how you're going to react to it. You know what I mean? And our uh, reaction is being good. That's yeah. what he's saying. Exactly. I, I, exactly. So, of course, we're going to keep this up. There's different very topics. We're going to. There's even more stuff to go talk about. Um, and what I realize, like people in 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 general, want to listen. John Murray, he touched me today with, with Bro, what he was doing. Hey, it, 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 it touched me, and I got props him again. I got props with Cooper for getting him on. I producer Gary for getting him on because he is speaking about the rules and it was him not trying to sugarcoat nothing him not saying it in a spiteful malicious way being open yes. relaxed and honest and i've taken a lot from that and also That's also it's like don't just count your blessings so all you want to hear do not just count your blessings live them it's as simple as that right and and that's what i took from john murray you you got to you just got to be grateful because it's, it's hard out there, man. It's hard. It's hard for boxers and uh, young boxers need to know this. Um, uh, Car Karma Serene, great, great, the great Karma Serene says, yeah, we love you, Smith. a union is necessary and the boxing commission should fund it. There you go. You're collecting enough peas. So definitely exactly. you should fund it. If, exactly. a, if, if the fighter have to pay fees for the belts they can reinvest in the fighter who put themselves through so much for the sport right. Bravo. Gary, pin this one up we have to use this now check this one out right border control are taking what four percent yeah. right you get certain um certain other bodies they're taking um three to four percent just take 1% from that, yeah? 1%, put it to one side for a trust fund. I know the British Board of Control do something like this, but just take 1% of that, put it to one side, so when fighters are in need, or when fighters are in 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 a, uh, in a bit of storm, that they can be helped. Now, I can turn around and say, I'm really grateful. Since retiring from boxing, I've done a lot, but I'm so grateful for the fact that I've been given the, the opportunity or the blessing to bless other people from MTK Global because I run the foundation, right? But that's just one organization. There should be 100, 200 of these because when we go out and you get your check and then when you get your check, you see that there's taxes coming out of it. 
Right. Oh, come on. Right. Don't talk about taxes, bro. Right. <laughs> bro, no one's not complaining that, especially in the UK, that you could go to NHS and it's free of charge. That's that's so true. Right. So at least to to to, to a certain extent, we could say all the roads are police. You know what I mean? On certain extent, we could turn around and say, well, actually, I see where my taxpayers' money's going. You know what I mean? Now, obviously, somebody's in a sport as hard and violent as boxing is, right? It's a brutal sport. And I've told people this many a times that is an unforgiving sport as well. It's an unforgiving sport if you're looking for forgiveness. How many guys have you known that have been around us who have been fighters, Tom, who have accomplished way more things than us than we ever did, right? And what are they doing now? They're in that of the depression. They're in that of, 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 so I'm telling you, but if there was something that was set up and like they could receive a phone, well, look when John was saying like the phone stopped ringing after he retired. You yes. see the lady, right, yes. the phone stopped ringing. You see, because people think, well, we don't need you no more. Mm. But it's those phone calls, those laughters, those, those, those phone calls are the things that raise up people's spirit. Yes. So to anyone who, who's listening on the live now, it ain't nothing for you to pick up the phone and just say, yo, man, I love you, you know? Or you're my guy, you know? Or big up Come yourself. Well, that, don't, that don't cost nothing. It don't cost nothing. Right? These things are important. But thank you so much for that because I'm, um, um, camera, because th there should be something like this that's, that's set in place. Yes, I mean? And the promoters. Yeah. And the promoters, right? There should be a tax on promoters. If promoters are earning a certain amount over a certain... There should be a tax on them to say, okay, then well, this money has to be put down to one side for any fire who's assigned to us that was to fall into any hard times. We should have to run benefit nights for, for certain fighters to go make money. Let me tell you this, right? Um, Kurt Lang in 1982 scored one of the biggest upsets in British boxing history. Come on, it. Roberto Duran. The great. Right? The great Roberto Duran. Colonel Lang right now is in Nottingham in an old people's home, right? No one not caring about this guy. I could name names and names and names. So what, you don't think these guys were suffering from depression by the time when they was fighting? And then when they were but, fighting, they got to do? But, but I, could it, you know, people would say, yeah, but it's his fault. People would say Sorry. it's his fault that he ended up like that. But, but, I'm, no, I'm not saying it. No, but no, I'm, I'm just speaking that. of it. I'm saying, what, how would you do with a, uh, an answer or a question like that. When people turn around and say, I'm saying this, yeah? As simple as it may seem, we say, well, it's his fault because they didn't invest their money properly or they didn't. Some, somewhere down the line, we have to break the inherent cycle of negativity. Come on. Two kids, right? Somewhere down the line. Because why is it that you can help the great Joel Lewis the man that held the world title for for just under 12 years. You know what I mean? It was 11, 11 years and eight months, right? A man that did so much for his country. Remember, he went to the war, you know, while being here with him and ended up being a greeter in, in the casinos in Las Vegas, right? So are we meant to say, well, you know, well, Joe Lewis is broken. Look how much money and he made box off his money. I'm talking about in the in the in the forties, he's picking up four hundreds and five hundred thousand dollar fights. Ridiculous, right? Crazy. So, but the man ended up being a greeter, a greeter, you know. So, so, am I so educated. Oh, sorry, no, no, no. So, am I meant to sit down and say, well, so somewhere in the lines now, we got to turn around and say we have to break this cycle. Yes. Yes. And, and I think the time's now for that cycle to be broken. Yes. Yes. We need to educate. And shows like this, there was a comment I read. Hold on. Will Stokes says, AY and Lions in the Camp as a mentality have been some of the greatest inspirations to me and have helped me focus my mentality when things have gotten bad. Big up, Will Stokes. Mm -hmm. Love that. Love that. Boxing Circle says, unfortunately... As fans, we only get shown the glitz and the glamour of boxing. And a show like this tonight needs to go out 
on live TV to really educate the fans on what boxers go through for us to see. And this is such a key point. Remember, when people, when you see these people criticizing other boxers, you all now have seen it. You've seen a man who was in the spotlight, John Murray, come on here and really emotionally tell you what this is about. It's not a joke. And this is why I'd be forever grateful for what AY has achieved thus far, knowing when so many boxers, champions, haven't had nothing to show for it when their careers are over. So you're right, brother. This needs to, Spence, you need to chat to your boys at MT Kit. You need to chat for them, chat to Dan. So Dan, let off some peas. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, we're talking the realness, and um, I think we're gonna go. We're gonna. Should we go to uh, forty-five spins? Come on, then we go. Yeah, we go to forty-five. Yeah. So five more minutes left of the yeah. show. Right? Oh, more questions, Gary. Yeah, let's get them. Chris Hall says he's annoyed. <laughs> he for, uh, I forgot this was scheduled for today. Bob, no, hit subscribe no, and then get the notification. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, boxing. What do you say? Um, Nas A says boxing is the best sport. There is yet the saddest game, yes. right? Shadiest uh, game, shadiest. You don't yeah. have to mash him up. Yeah, <laughs> shadiest game. I fear for fighters nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I fear fighters nowadays in a fickle fan era. Hope no current fighters experience any financial ruins. Listen, it's a game. And unfortunately, there are going to be certain fighters that are going to face financial ruins. It's the game, yeah. right? Yeah. But um, readers and leaders, um, think and go rich. Read something by Napoleon Hill. Uh, the simple fact of um, that you could turn around and even if you take 10% of your money, which you're earning a month, put it to one side. 10%. Yes, yes. but that, that in itself takes yeah. discipline. Routine, yeah. Yeah. and this and this is what John Murray was talking about. Uh, Deji Channel, one of our great supporters, big up, big up, Deji, good, good guy. Has said that Bruno had it bad with depression. Bad. <laughs> the worst thing was seeing British fans of the sport disrespecting Bruno like he hasn't changed the sport for us. I'm not pretending I um I wasn't a Tyson guy. Spence, I know you can touch on this big. I can. When he's saying a Tyson guy, what Tyson is he talking about? Um, I'm not pretending I'm I wasn't a Tyson guy. So basically, obviously, he's talking about when Tyson fought Bruno, but still okay. yeah, right. you understand? Well, we're gonna keep it 100 when it comes to Frank Bruno, right? On certain when I look back now, because Frank Bruno was my childhood, I grew up watching Frank Bruno and stuff. I wasn't the biggest fan of Frank Bruno. It's crazy, but me and Frank Bruno are very close now. We talk regularly. I've got a lot of time for Frank Bruno. He's battled some real demons, right? And I think there was a lot of pressure for him. Like, Frank Bruno is actually a very intelligent man. Very. Right? Very intelligent man. Forget about the persona that he had to portray to be, yeah, thank God, Ricky, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, thank God, ho, 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 ho. All of that, right? <laughs> right, Frank was an intelligent man, right? But he had to dumb himself down to be accepted by the masses. So if they saw mm. a big, cuddly, telly, teddy bear, right, he'd be this inoffensive Bruno instead of what he was. Frank Bruno was an assassin. Go look at I was watching Frank Bruno's fight with him two nights ago. What a fight. They, and this, that was 1986, they had 50,000 people in Wembley. Come on. Right? 1986. Frank Bruno was that was that was his world title challenge against Terrible Tim Wimberspoon when he gets stopped in the 11th round. Frank could fight. And the thing about it is this, it was like, of course, you've been a darling, right? And this is how wicked um society is. He was when he fought Frank, when he fought um when he fought um Mike Tyson in the second fight, yeah, in 96. He was introduced by Jimmy Lennon Jr. as Britain's 
favorite son. That was the key. Remember, every time Frank Bruno yeah, was there, of course. Britain's favorite <coughs> son, right? This man, Frank Bruno, when he was introduced as Britain's favorite son, and they was all loving him, Bruno, Bruno, Bruno. Everybody was nuts over Frank Bruno. I remember going into a pub watching Frank Bruno fight. We the didn't pub when you don't drink. I don't know, but I was a kid, I had to go to the pub. <laughs> I didn't have to play. And they showed the first Bruno fight, the first Bruno fight was 1989, February 25th. The knowledge. Uh, against Mike Tyson, right? And it was also the anniversary of 20 years in, it was also 25, sorry, 25 years in from when uh, Muhammad Ali for Sonny Liston, the same date, but that was in 64. The knowledge, right? the knowledge. So Don King deliberately did that, right? Um, Richard Still was a referee. There was a big argument about with Terry Lawless, he's then uh, manager. Terry Lawless did not want your man George Francis, who actually committed suicide as well, who was Frank Bruno's Frank Bruno's trainer. Yes, George Francis yes, trained yes, great great fighters. John H. Tracy trained, uh, they trained um, um John Conte, former world like heavyweight champion, WBC. So so Bruno had good guys around him. But at the time when Bruno lost that fight, I was I was there because I watched it. Yeah, I watched that fight in a pub because it was on Sky. And I didn't have Sky. And that's when Sky first, that was Sky's first major boxing event that they showed. It was mm -hmm. Frank When they showed that fight, I remember being in there and the majority of people were, were, were white people inside there. Because that's how I love that Bruno, when I mean like he was a crossover, Bruno was this massive. Cross. He was he was so accepted, but at what cost? So him not being himself kind of bit him in the bum a little bit. Then mm. there's three people that were loving him. When he started to have the mental health issues. And there was disrespect him. Bonkers Bruno, do you remember that? Because Bruno, I remember that. Hold on, big up Roger Diamond. You know we can't forget Roger Diamond. Oh, come on, come on. Big up Roger Diamond. Music. Right. right. So Bruno's been for it. But the thing what I like with Frank Bruno, whereas he's been open about his counseling, open uh, about the therapy that he has taken for mental health, right? It's so crazy. The last time I saw Frank Bruno at a fight was when Dylan White fought Rebus. And it was still beautiful to see the um, the response that he got when they called his name. The whole crowd, Bruno, Bruno, Bruno. You know what I mean? Because Frank Bruno, back then, we thought the guy limited the ability. Go watch him now. Frank Bruno was was very good, Joe. Very good. I said that. No one in Europe, no one in Europe could test that right. And was it Clap. You. Yeah. And he could punch. Boy, he could punch. Go watch his yeah. fight. He hits Mike Tyson in the first round with a left hook. Yeah. You know I mean? Harry Carpenter. Mike Tyson. And Harry Carpenter went, man, get in there, Frank. Get in there, Frank. Get in there. Right. <laughs> yeah, the great Harry Carpenter. Just yeah, man. The rest of soul, man. All right, listen. Uh, Gary is... Has, has, has put out a question here. Gary, get in there, Frank. Daddy Wright remembers it. He said, what topic... Should we discuss on Sunday women's boxing, top five trainers, ultimate boxer, best hook of all time edition? So we're going to do a little poster for that. But for those online now and those who are going to rewatch this on YouTube, we're putting it out there to the public. You know, um, <laughs> I, I see peace and love boxing. But uh, Rob Zui say women's boxing, Ellie Scott, South London girl. We know Ellie. I watched, I know Ellie when she was coming in there, bro. Little whippersnapper <laughs> turned, you know, turned into a, a you know, like a, a, a beautiful swan and punching girls up. <laughs> Punch a big up Ellie Scott, South London. Um, but yeah, well, Gary's putting it out there. The topic we're putting out there to the public, you know, and uh, we'll do a vote. Well, Gary, I'm sure Gary you know, the man behind the cam will get up something where you can vote, because I've seen it before, like press for, you know, the, the, the various topics. So it's a good one. Women's boxing, yeah. for Sunday, we should we discuss women's boxing, top five trainers. We need to, 
really be specific on that. Whether it's top five traders in the UK or top five traders in the world. Or um, of the past. Of the past as well. Um, ultimate boxer. Um, I don't know what what that really means, ultimate boxer. But oh, I'm definitely... I know, I know. But you know, they've kind of done that. They've kind of done that one. On the light. So you say the jab of Larry Holmes. The, okay. you know, the right hand of Tommy Hearns. Speed of Roy Jones. Left hook of Sugar Ray Robinson, da, 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 all the rest of it. I, I mean, that's that's kind of um, David East is the same thing. Best left hook. Um, and, and and Gary, the one you have to put up there is knockout of the year. Will it? Will it will be? It'll be twenty twenty. We got. We didn't do that. We yeah. got to do knockout at twenty twenty, and that was from Lady Shan came up with that suggestion. So. We got you got to fling that in there because there were some vicious knockouts last year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so uh, Gary, Gary, what we're doing is, can you put pictures up here as well? Yeah, like, can you? Let me know if you can. I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. but even online now, people are, are putting up suggestions. Uh, De Deji says Povetkin's knockout was the was the knockout of the year. Boxing Circle is talking about. Old generation, generation v, v the new, um, but Rob May is always saying, already saying, Tank was the knockout of the year. Listen, listen, and again, this this is what it, this this channel is about. It's about interacting with the fans, and um, and I literally giving people a chance to, you know, air their views. Um, Leon Figures again, big enough. Please give a list of must see fights from the past that display certain skills. Um, uh, suspense, I would love to do that because, you know, like I said, I could talk about that for three hours by myself, but yeah, you know, it's by your own, <laughs> on your own. yeah. Um, uh, I, do like, I do like top trainers, you know, I do like top, top trainers, trainers is good because, it's, it's a, because it's, I'm with a trainer right now, um, so it'd be very subjective, but I think it'd be fun. I think top, top trainers will be will be a good one. Will be a good one, yeah. And women's yeah. boxing because yeah. whether we like it or don't like it, but it's not going nowhere. It's, it's not going nowhere. It's, it's going to be here for. And the school know, it, played by certain females right now is like wow. So it's not male or female boxing. It's just boxing, and that's how yeah. I say. Right, you know what I mean that's how I say. It. So yeah, you know what I mean, or maybe yeah, we could do my, maybe we could do a top five best women's boxers in the world today. Yes, yes. She yes. like Katie Taylor. Katie Taylor got um, Ring Magazine Female Fighter of the Year. Yes. Right? And um, I think Clarissa Shield was like, nah, bro, that should be me. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know Chris is about that beef. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and she was a guest of our show as well. But, you know what I mean? I like Katie Taylor. She's a lovely girl. But I oh, should... So so, sorry, Spence. Go on. Good fire. Go on, continue, Tom. Don't worry about me. No, Boston Rose Boxing said, these lives are generally unreal. I'm a boxing person and grown up around it my whole life. This is gold, Spencer. So we're getting... It, it, this thing is... This ain't going nowhere. We're going to keep this going. And especially in, in, in lockdown, you know, we all know how to March, definitely, the people need to, you know, have something to to tune into. So we're going to do our utmost best to have at least three of these a week, at least. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, and, and, and yeah, you know, we're always going to be asking you, the fans, to give us the topics to discuss, you know, um, and we'll, we'll take it from there. But Spence, you know we can go on for a long time. No, I, have, I have nothing more to say. Join yes. us on Sunday. We're yes. gonna put a poll on that on on Twitter, YouTube, Twitter. You you can do polls now on YouTube as well. Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. So it'd be um, Tundi Ajay Nine. Is that right? Uh, it's Instagram is Tundi Ajay Nine. But the Twitter, it's on the on the Twitter. It's Tundi Nine Nine Nine. Cause I'm the police, man. <laughs> no, <laughs> man. You're trying to trick us. It's really six six six. You're the devil. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you're starting again, you're starting again. Yeah, you're starting again. Laughter, um, um, yeah, or master underscore not master master underscore knowledge on Twitter, 
and Spencer underscore fear on, on Instagram. It's both. It's all linked up. Makes no difference. But yeah, we're going to put that out. It's been a plum pleasing pleasure for myself. Tony's going to end the show by saying... Dream it. Believe it. Become it. <laughs> Come on down. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Catch you on Sunday at 8 o'clock for another plum pleasing show with Baba Tundi Ajay, Master Genius, Spencer Knowledge Ferron, and the man behind the cam, Gary. Yeah, Gary, not too late, Blake. Come on, come on. The man behind the cam. On Insta, he is I am Mr. Blake. On Twitter, he is Mr. Blake 03. So, yeah, check him out. He do not show his face too much. But believe you me, Gary is so instrumental uh, to everything that's going on and, and uh, allowing us oldies like me and Spencer to really operate on this level because we wouldn't know nothing about no computers <laughs> and no stream or nothing, even though we could learn. But yeah, big up, Gary. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. And we'll see you all on Sunday. <laughs>